Welcome to an IAPMD professional community webinar. In this clinical practice webinar, Dr. Ariana DeFlorio will be providing basic concepts of differential diagnosis and management of women in AFAB individuals presenting with symptoms of bipolar disorder and PMDD. Thank you so much for coming. People still coming in, but we're going to get started. Um, first of all, so my name is Laura Murphy. I'm Director of Education and Awareness here at IAPMD. We also have with us um, Dr. Tori eisenlewer -Mull. Um, She is the Chair of the Clinical Advisory Board here at IAPMD. She's going to be helping out um, doing the Q&A and she'll be in the chat as well. If you've got any questions, do ask. There you go. And today's session is Differential Diagnosis. Um, helping you discover and learn more about how to make a differential diagnosis between bipolar disorder, PMDD, and premenstrual exacerbation of bipolar disorder with the very wonderful Ariana De Florio. Thank you so much for being here. Here you go, just a little disclosure if you read that. Lovely to see so many names we recognize and some new ones um, in the chat bar. Welcome, welcome. And if you do have any concerns throughout the process, do email um, Dr. Tori Eisenman Mull over here on her email. Oh, okay. And with that, I am going to pass over to Dr. Ariana De Florio if you want to have a go at screen sharing. And then we'll get going. First of all, thank you so much, Laura and Tori, uh, for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here uh, this evening. I have nothing to disclose. I have no conflict of interest. Um, this talk is aimed to a generalist audience with a clinical interest in mental health. Um, my, uh, the learning objectives for these are um, for you to familiarize with the differential diagnosis of women presenting with symptoms of bipolar disorders and or PMDD, and to understand uh, the principle of management of women with bipolar disorder and premenstrual exacerbation of bipolar disorder. Um, my talk is divided in three sections. In the first one, I'll introduce bipolar disorder, its symptoms, diagnosis, and management. Uh, then I'll discuss the differential diagnosis of recurrent mood disturbances and difficult management decisions associated with that. And in the last part, I'll talk about premenstrual exacerbation of bipolar disorder and PMDD in women with bipolar disorder. Um, the literature on menstrual health in bipolar disorder is extremely limited, and also this, is, this wants to be a more clinical talk rather than a research one. Um, so most of what I'm going to say tonight is based on the wisdom of old-fashioned books and uh, also on my own experience with the Reproductive Mental Health Clinic, which I run in Cardiff. Our clinic is a UK-wide free of charge service providing second opinions on complex psychiatric disorders associated with reproduction and on sensi gender sensitive diagnosis and management of severe mental illness. It is part of our reproductive mental health program, which is integrates research, teaching and clinical practice. This is the first program of this kind in the United Kingdom. The issues that we're going to discuss tonight are extremely complex and we re require interdisciplinary approaches. As all of us clinicians approach people with complex uh, mental illness, uh, we are, I think I like to imagine us like the blind monks examining an elephant in the beautiful Buddhist parable. I would attend tonight to uh, provide a synthesis of various approaches uh, to um, very complex issues, both from the biomedical and uh, from the socio-ecological paradigm. So uh, the first big uh, bit of the talk is about bipolar disorder symptoms, diagnosis and management. One of the challenges in psychiatry is to translate human experience into coded terms that allow communication and reproducibility. Here on the left, you see a description of the experience of bipolar disorder by Kay Jamison, who's an author, psychologist, and an academic who has lived experience of bipolar disorder. Um, she, she described her experience in very vivid terms. She says all the incredible feelings to sow through, then two are the bitter reminders, credit card rewards bounced, checked to cover, explanations to at work, apologies to make, intermittent memories, what did I do, friendships gone or drained or ruined marriage. 
And then she asked us, uh, you know, like which part, what is real, which is me, is uh, which of me is me, the wild, impulsive, chaotic, energetic, and crazy one, or the shy, withdrawn, desperate, suicidal, doom, and tired one. Probably a bit of both. Uh, hopefully, much that is neither. And how do we translate this to communicate between us and to make our uh, science and clinical work reproducible. And on the right here, you have the definition according to the official diagnostic system. Bipolar disorder is a disorder characterized by two or more episodes of which patient, um, patient's mood and activity levels are significantly disturbed. This disturbance consisting on some occasions of an elevation of the mood and increased energy and activity called hypomania or mania, and on the others of lowering of mood and decreased energy or activity. And this is called depression. The key um, feature of bipolar disorder is mania. Now the spectrum of severity has uh, broadened to increase also less severe states called hypomania. And mania is a distinct period of abnormally persistently elevative, expansive, or irritable mood. And this is really important, goal-directed behavior or energy. And this last part, the behavioral and energy component of mania has been added only to the last um, iteration of the DSM. Um, this is not the happiness we are all experiencing. This is a quite different and abnormal state. Um, the other criteria include um, self-esteem, um, inflated self-esteem and grandiosity, decreased need of sleep, which is difficult and different, although different from insomnia. Um, people can be more talkative than usual. Uh, they may experience a flux of idea or subjective experience that thoughts are racing, they're more distractible, and there is usually ex excessive involvement in activities that have a high potential for painful consequences. I think um, tonight we don't have the time. I think I invite you to watch uh, any of these three videos, the link, I think you will have the slides available to see how actually uh, mania uh, looks. These are free uh, educational videos in which, um, with, not with real patients, but with actors, but I think really um, mania is a, something that if you see in a medical talk contest, you should be able to recognize because it's a dramatic, um, uh, it's a dramatic mental state. Hypomania, on the contrary, is more difficult, and I think the least, less severe forms of, um, of these uh, manic states are more difficult to identify, and especially are quite difficult to, for the patients to report retrospectively when they come to your clinic and they tell you about their history, medical history. So um, the modern classification systems usually define um, some uh, two sub main subtypes of bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder one, when full manic, severe manic episodes are present, and bipolar disorder two, when depressive episodes uh, alternate with hypomania, which is a less severe form of mania. Um, and this is a um, cut, um, picture from a very beautiful graphic novel on bipolar disorder, again, produced by a woman with lived experience. And this is a beautiful, beautiful way to learn about bipolar disorder. Here you can see there are two other states we, uh, that I haven't mentioned yet, which is mixed states and rapid cycling. What does that mean? Mis mixed uh, states are states in which the symptoms of high mood of mania uh, coexist at the same time with symptoms of depression. These are very unpleasant and dangerous. Uh, mental states. And then we have rapid cycling in which three or four or more episodes occur within um, 12 months. So you have many episodes, distinct episodes of illness within one year. So this is, I told you about the different mood states, but if you look then at the longitudinal um, uh, aspects of the of course of bipolar disorder, uh, you'll see that there are many other, um, you know, like states and there is a rapid change in picture and the picture is, more, is way more complex than what DSM and uh, ICD uh, make. In particular, this is um, this is a, a screenshot of graphing of the graphing of mood states from a person with bipolar disorder that um, participated uh, participated to our bipolar disorder research network True Color study, which is run in collaboration with uh, Worcester University and Oxford University, and True Colors use. Uh, um, 
Um, it's an internet-based system that allows participants to complete a writing scale for mania and one for depression once a week. And as you can see here, the reality is way more complex than the discreetly defined episodes described in the diagnostic manuals. Here you can see a lot of threshold, sub-threshold symptoms, frequent mood changes, complex mood state changes in which depression and a mania coexist. In terms of treatments, um, the next few slides are dedicated to the CANMAT guidelines. There are very well um, codified um, you know, uh, treatment algorithms for bipolar disorder. And, um, and the treatment, of course, is different according to the uh, current symptoms and what is the longitudinal course of the disorders. Um, it's worth mentioning, and this is what these slides remind you, that um, mania can be really, really severe um, and can include psychotic symptoms and patients usually presenting with severe um, you know, manic states uh, are acutely agitated and require uh, so short-term pharmacological interventions to deal with the agitation. Uh, a manic uh, acute mania uh, requires usually as first light treatments, especially monotherapy, are usually either second generation and what are called second generation antipsychotics, such as quetiapine, um, aripiprazole here, you see risperidone, this is the top line, uh, but you know, lithium is also very effective, although it requires a bit of time um, to, to reach um, the concentrations and, um, that you want and the effect that you want. And uh, Divalprex, uh, um, a key message for tonight is that usually Valproate here is called in this table, Divalprex should not be prescribed uh, to women uh, who have of childbearing potential or if that it's prescribed, you know, it becomes really complicated, so it's better to avoid. Um, this, uh, this is uh, the main treatment, I would say. So mood stabilizer, especially the theum uh, and um, second generation antipsychotics. Uh, for the treatment of depression, you can see, and I think this is another take home message for um, this evening, is that as you can see, the first line treatments for bipolar depression are not antidepressants. And I'll repeat this multiple times tonight, uh, and, and the use of antidepressants in general in bipolar disorder is controversial and potentially uh, it, can be, um, it can be triggering uh, manic episodes or uh, you know, mixed states or in general mood instability. So usually the first, treating bipolar depression is extremely challenging and difficult. And uh, very often it requires really, really months, if not years to, to get it right. And uh, first line treatment is quetiapine usually. And then again, lithium has got also, can be used also for depression, but lamotrigine is another um, mood, considered mood stabilizer. Um, in, uh, in uh, this case, or again, you can see another um, a treatment I don't know if you're familiar with, which is ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, that can, the evidence is limited, but um, it, it's used uh, in, in other contexts also in bipolar disorder, I'm thinking about uh, postpartum episodes, but these are all um, options. And again, um, SSRIs are usually, uh, prescribed um, if they are prescribed, uh, always with a lot of care, only a second line treatment um, for just acute, uh, you know, like uh, depression, um, and again uh, with a lot of care and always with a uh, mood stabilizer. And again, they come with the risk of uh, triggering manic episodes of mood instability. So going to um, I talk a bit about differential diagnosis of recurrent mood disturbances and difficult managing management decisions. First of all, I remind you, you should be really familiar with this by now, which is these are the DSM criteria for PMTD. And here I'm focusing, um, it's always difficult to put in just one slide the criteria of DSM for PMTD or any disorder, because there are many of them. But here they are, written in very small characters, but I'm sure you know them very well. So um, the core symptoms here are affective liability, irritability or anger, increased interpersonal conflict, depressed mood and associated feelings and thoughts, and marked anxiety, tension or feeling of being uh, kid up or on edge. 
if you remember what I said about bipolar disorder here, you can start to see the overlaps. So in bipolar disorder, we have irritable mood and here we have irritability. Bipolar disorder, and I show you a bit the longitudinal course, it looks like there, there are a lot of mood changes happening and that can be seen as mood instability. And in PMDD, we talk about mood swings. Then we have both uh, depression as a possible mood state and anxiety as well as a mood state. If you're wondering, because you've never seen the PM ID and then followed by a number, that is a um, very sure way to report references. And if you Google that, you can find immediately the paper it refers to. I want to dedicate a bit of time now to irritability first and then to mood instability, because especially if you don't have much experience of psychiatry, these are quite difficult concepts to grasp and are very important for the discussion we are having tonight on differential diagnosis. So irritability is, a, is difficult to define. And this is a very nice review that actually pinpoints the difficulties um, and the controversies around this, uh, this um, concept and can be defined as a heightened sensitivity to stimuli along with a lower threshold for responding to stimuli with an increased propensity for anger. But this is subjective, this is not anger, this is the feeling before, you know, like it can predispose you to anger, but it's different from angry anger and it's um, absolutely subjective. So it's something you can't see from the outside. It is the patient that needs to tell you, I feel irritable. So this is distinct from anger and aggression, but it can be a contributing factor to instances of anger, anger aggression or impulsivity in both youth and adults. And I think, you know, there is a conflation. We tend to confuse anger and aggression with irritability. And this can happen also in assessment tools. So sometimes to studies that are meant, want to study irritability use measure, measures of anger. And I would say that probably um, child psychiatry is doing a better job with irritability than adult psychiatrists are doing. And it's a feature of many disorders, not only bipolar disorder and PMDD, as you can see. And it's said to be more common in females. And, but I wonder about that. And also, uh, I think so we need to put what I'm telling you tonight into the context of what is called a man's man's word. And, Young women, especially nowadays, are a very high risk group in terms of mental health. Um, self harm has doubled. There is a lot of self harm, one in four. And um, so is the screen for uh, post traumatic stress disorder, which is um, again also increased. And the gap between uh, mental health and uh, between young women and young men has also increased. And uh, suicide rates in young women have increased rapidly, and they're the current the highest on record. And also um, um, an estimated 80% of the 50 million people affected by violent conflict, civil wars, disaster, and displacer are women or children. And li lifetime rate of violence against women ranges from 16% to 50%, with at least one in five women suffering of rape or attempt rape in their lifetime. So there is a lot of uh, environmental aspects that we need to take, and cultural, I think, aspects when we assess and um, decide what to do with irritability in women. I think there is a, a lot to be irritable about. Um, however, there are also some neurobiological drivers of um, irritability identified mostly using neuroimages and um, the uh, neurological, so neurobiological substrates differ um, uh, with illness and age and there, there are interventions that are supposed to be um, uh, helping with irritability, but they lack usually the necessary specificity. Here you can see SSRI, antipsychotic mood stabilizer here um, are mentioned in this picture. Um, and SSRIs, uh, you may know, are also used in the treatment of PMDD. But as I said, they might trigger uh, many in bipolar disorder. And if they're used in bipolar disorder, they need to be used with also um, an anti-psychotic uh, or mood stabilizer. 
The second possible overlap that I wanted to discuss a bit more in detail is mood swings or mood instability. And already here, you can see the uh, cows in the terminology. In fact, mood instability can be, has multiple names, can be called affective liability, instability, dysregulation, emotional dysregulation, emotional liability, mood liability and mood swings, emotional impulsiveness. And again, this is another review, which I think uh, does a really great job to um, define and uh, to talk about the definitions and the measurements of um, uh, mood instability. It can be defined as uh, rapid oscillations of intense effect with a difficulty in regulating these oscillations and their behavioral consequences. Um, sometimes it's defined as sudden mood changes. The DSM, I must say, doesn't do a good job defining mood instability. And uh, there are, uh, according to this review, 24 distinct measures that could be categorized as primarily mere measuring one of the four facets of mood instability or as measuring the general construct of emotional regulation. In the, again, it's quite prevalent in the general population. And I put here this editorial, this BMJ open study, because the rates they report are quite different. And I think the reason why the rates are different uh, is because the definitions are different, the way it is assessed are different. Um, I think there is agreement, again, that is more common in women than men, uh, with big prevalence in uh, younger women. And again, it's a feature of several psychiatric disorders and involved in the origins and affect the prognosis in many of them. And usually it makes, uh, when there is mood instability, usually the prognosis is worse. Um, I think there is a big elephant in the room that in a discussion about a differential diagnosis of bipolar disorder and PMDD needs absolutely to be addressed, and that's borderline personality disorder um, that can be also called emotionally unstable personality disorder. Uh, this is um, uh, this picture here is from a review by uh, Gunderson, who is, I think is an amazing author. If you want to read about borderline personality disorder, I really like his approach. And he, um, in this review, they, they identify four um, core symptom dimensions. One is affective or emotional dysregulation. And again, you can see symptoms that we've already seen for PMDD and bipolar disorder, which is mood instability, anger, then behavioral dysregulation, including um, self-harming suicidal behaviors, cognitive and self-disturbance, um, like paranoid ideation, and also identity disturbance and interpersonal instability. Um, I put here this picture of the history of the concept of borderline personality disorder because I think it's a very interesting story. And it's a disorder that carries uh, an amount of stigma that at least in my clinical practice, I don't see with any other disorder. I think it, it's really, um, it's. It's a diagnosis that is very difficult to accept for patients. And I think sometimes clinicians working with uh, people with borderline personality disorders also tend to find this condition a bit challenging. Um, why is it so challenging? Well, first of all, because um, psychotropic medication do not work that well in borderline personality disorder. And actually the NICE guidelines should just not to use them to treat symptoms, but only to prescribe them for comorbid disorders and for the shortest period of time. And I really like this idea again from the Gunderson paper that says augmentation of medications is common, but without empirical support. Uh, how common, uh, at least 40% uh, of uh, people with borderline personality disorder in a 16-year follow-up study were taking three or more psychotropic medications. So a lot uh, is really, really common. So if we don't use medications, what um, do we use? And I think there is very good evidence for, um, uh, for um, talking therapies and probably the one where are more supported by evidence is dialectical uh, behavioral therapy. 
what really strikes me about this uh, this table is when you read the training that um, you know like therapists need is is really minimal um, according compared to the severe at least in my opinion and also compared to the severity of uh, the you know like uh, the interpersonal interpersonal relationships with patients with uh, borderline personality disorder and. Um, I wanted briefly to mention five, again, from the Gundersoll paper, five uh, um, principles of management of people with borderline personality disorder, uh, because if you work with PMDD and bipolar disorder, I think this is, these are really important elements to, to know. And um, it is ideal to have a primary clinician who develops the treatment plan and goals and oversees the risk of suicide and monitors progress. The management should have structure, structure and boundaries are really important. And also they should be collaborative and all, you know, the patients should really uh, be engaged and should be responsible as well. Um, the clinician should be really responsive and reassuring of the patient, um, of the patient and, but should also be self-aware. And I think these are really, really difficult patients and uh, really, the, they are challenging, and but also at the same time, you know, the reactions of the clinicians can be really, really harmful uh, to the patient. So I think uh, that although there is a primary clinician, it's good to have a team to support that clinician. I want to, um, I, I told you about the blind monks and the elephant, and I think with these conditions, there, there are many perspectives that go beyond uh, that go beyond beyond diagnosis and DSM. Um, and one perspective is the circadian one, and these are this is a series of uh, four studies published by the group in Oxford led by Kate Saunders, most of these studies. And they are small studies, you know, like there are less than 40 people with bipolar disorder, there are about 20 with borderline personality disorder. And unfortunately, the group with borderline personality disorder is always biased toward um, female participants and then healthy controls. And what they found is actually that actigraphy, um, which is a, um, a, um, a technological tool to measure activity, distinguishes between bipolar disorder and borderline personality disorder. And they say, again, I think really, really, um, nice sentence here. Um, they say that these differences validate the greatest subjective complaints of borderline personality disorders individuals that are sometimes regarded as exaggerated by clinicians. Clinicians can be frustrated by and also um, like dismissive of people with borderline personality disorders. So I think this is actually a great study to show that actually there is a substrate there. And um, there are also, uh, you know, disruptions and differences uh, in uh, between conditions in the circadian rhythms. Uh, and um, Kay, Kay Saunders and his, uh, her team uh, made really complex studies, um, you know, like around the um, circadian rhythms, uh, borderline um, personality disorder and bipolar disorder. They are quite complex, but um, the take-home message is that there are these. And this perspective allows to see different signatures in bipolar disorder and borderline personality disorder in healthy controls. And actually, borderline personality disorder has got um, um, disruption of the circadian rhythms that is quite significant. And then there is, of course, the circumstantial perspective. I'm not going to say much here because we have here in uh, Tori, who is an absolute um, expert. In this, and I'm sure if you have any question on this specific perspective, I think Tori is the best person um, to talk about this. Um, so, okay, we've now seen what can what can underpin these symptoms. So, what's the difference here? Well, between mania, bipolar disorder, PMDD, and borderline, and I think timing here is key. The timing, mania, we, we said, and this is what the DSM said, is a distinct period. So, you know, like yes, a beginning at the end of the episodes. In PMDD, there is, of course, an association uh, with the menstrual cycle. So you would expect that, again, it's a distinct period, but here the period is, um, you know, like, is cyclical and is associated with the menstrual cycle. For borderline, instead, usually it begins in early adults and presents in a variable, um, variety of contexts. So it's a more 
chronic uh, mental uh, state, actually a complex um, sum of mental states, but uh, it begins in early adulthood and it changes perhaps, but it's quite uh, stable in its, um, in its, you know, like disruptiveness. And so uh, the answer, I think the best answer to, 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 to manage this differential diagnosis is really prospective monitoring of symptoms. Um, there are, however, tricky situations. And again, um, when I showed you the mood monitoring of patients with bipolar disorder, you can see that it's not clear cut. Uh, the mood states in bipolar disorder are really not clear cut. And there are other conditions that are particularly tricky. And one is cyclothymia, which is in you know, like periods of depression and elation, similar to manic depressive disorder, but less severe in nature and more chronic. And they can have numerous hypomanic episodes. They're still pervasive, they're still, um, you know, diseases. So, you know, they impair functional and they are not pleasant. And they, 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 they can also, uh, you know, be cyclical. So this is another cyclical condition that is not severe and dramatic as mania. So it becomes difficult to say what it is sometimes. And but bipolar two disorder that doesn't have mania. So you know again when mania is not severe, it's less difficult to assess it. The high states, uh, in the high mood states are more difficult. So then rapid cycling again, because there are many episodes in one year. And so you know like if you have let's say twelve months in a year, uh, twelve episodes sorry in one year, you think oh they might be related to the menstrual cycle. So it gets it can get easily complicated. And probably the most complicated of all is when PMDD um, appears in people with history of bipolar disorder or where people with bipolar disorder have a circumenstrual exacerbation of their symptoms. And I'm saying here circumenstrual because it can be premenstrual, but it can be also at other points of the menstrual cycle. And I'm going to dedicate the last part of my talk to uh, these conditions. So uh, this is a very uh, complex topic, made particularly complex by the fact there is no much literature around. And my PhD um, supervisor and lifetime mentor, Ian Jones, Professor Ian Jones, um, used to um, cite in his own talks, Donald Ransfield, when he said that, I don't know if you're familiar with this, um, he was asked uh, about, um, for the war, I think it was war in Iraq, uh, but I don't remember if it was Iraq or Afghanistan. It was said, uh, there are unknowns and knowns, and there are things we know we know. There are also knowns that we are known unknowns. That is to say that we know there are some things we don't know. And I think here there are really a lot of things we don't know, but there are also unknown unknowns, and these are really what should worry us as clinicians and as researchers, which are the things we don't know, we know. And to exemplify this and to put this in the context of PMDD and bipolar disorder, this is a updated research that I ran just this afternoon on um, bipolar disorder and uh, you know, like menstrual um, and luthal phase. Uh, using these terms as keywords. And as you can see, there is not much in the literature. And I'm, you know, if you run this literature really quickly, as I did this afternoon, uh, be aware that bipolar is a term that also appears for surgical intervention related to gynecological procedures. So reference is actually way more than well. Uh, needs to be for, for uh, the scope of this talk. And there is actually only a bunch of studies. There is very, very few studies on the burden or the burden of the clinical, um, you know, like uh, comorbidity between bipolar disorder and uh, PMDD. And they have major limitations. Most, uh, you know, like the one with a decent Sample size usually have a retrospective design, otherwise, especially the longitudinal one, have very small sample size with less than 30 women. And also, it looks like there are many studies, but then the authors are usually, the names are recurring and makes me think that actually the 30 women in all studies are exactly the same. 30 women, the symptoms, sometimes when studies are longitudinal, well characterized, they talk about symptoms rather than full episodes um, of bipolar disorders, for example, or full or PMS instead of PMDD. So they usually uh, highlight um, 
symptoms that might or might not be clinically significant. And of course, then there are issues related to sample selection and lack of replication. On the other side, studies, uh, clinical trials, there is no clinical trials uh, on uh, PMDD and bipolar disorder on this comorbidity. And I always like to compare this to other disorders, um, both uh, reproductive um, phenotypes such as postpartum depression and depression at the time of the menopause. And on the other side, erectile dysfunction, where there are over 2000 clinical trials. I'm not talking about general research, just clinical trials on the topic. So how, given that there is not much in the literature, I'm going to tell you what I usually do when a patient presents with a clinical question about bipolar disorder and PMDD and differential diagnosis. I think the first important clinical step for me is always to exclude medical comorbidity or to assess it at least. And this includes also medication, thyroid, um, you know, I always check the thyroid, supplement, whether the person takes supplements and menstrual health, etc. Something we don't ask, I think, enough at least, and we don't understand, I think it's, um, not we're not not always I see it's not always appreciated is the effect of coffee alcohol and cannabis and painkillers uh, in um, in uh, you know like and their effects on mood I think these are very important um, as, um, you know like factors and I'm thinking about painkillers because uh, I've had several patients that um, had a comorbid endometriosis or other, other conditions and so it was very difficult to say what how much was the mood problem how much was um, perhaps um, too confident use of painkillers. And I want to remind you the uh, guidelines for alcohol. Usually it's a recommend, the recommendation is of, you, of drinking less than 14 units a week. And I usually use with uh, my patients and also with myself, I must confess, the calculators and I'm always really surprised on the results that are always higher than what I expect. So uh, if you, for example, uh, you like to drink your glass of wine every night, you are already at 25 units against the 14 units that are recommended by um, the guidelines. So it's very easy to go above the units recommended. Um, and another aspect, the second aspect, then once you know the medical comorbidity are assessed, is the longitudinal prospective daily monitoring of symptoms. And because of what we are talking tonight, the symptoms might be or might be not um, different from PMDD symptoms. There might be other symptoms, there might be similar symptoms, might be a combination of symptoms. So I think it's always good to ask the woman what she finds or, or the person with PMDD, what uh, they find uh, bothersome. And also it's important to use the terminology that the person uses, not the terminology that we understand. Uh, and again, I've made the example of irritability. So being really clear, well, if it's anger, is irritability what it is, and also ask um, people what they use um, to describe their condition. And they can use those terminologies in their mood um, uh, diaries. And also, again, I think severity is really important because one thing is to have physiological mild premenstrual symptoms, and another thing is to have um, a very disruptive premenstrual exacerbation. On this, um, what we use usually is a blend of the menstrual diary as usually is used with PMTD and the more life charting, mood monitoring uh, approach that is used in the field of mood disorders. And, um, and I think both um, approaches have got also not only a diagnostic component, but also a CBT, if you want, component. And uh, we tend to personalize this. This is, in case you're not familiar with life charting and mood monitoring, this is a screenshot from our beating bipolar psychoeducation program in Cardiff. And basically the live charting is on a lifespan. You can do this with the mood monitoring on a daily basis, which is what we do in the case of um, the differential diagnosis between PMDD and bipolar disorder. And what, what you do is you try to also find if there are other factors that might affect your mood. They can be events, they can be related to medications, they can be related to your general health. Um, and so we invite um, people also to, to, to report those events. 
And there is an argument whether it should be paper, paper or electronic. Personally, I'm a huge fan of pen and paper, but I totally understand that people that, especially nowadays, prefer electronic forms. And usually what we, we do is to provide really reassurance and feedback to people because this is, um, there is a lot of investment in diagnosis, especially for people with borderline personality disorders. I have uh, a lot of patients that come really with the mission to get rid of their diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. And I think it's really important to reassure them that, and to validate, you know, like, um, and also, especially if patients put um, you know, their identity, a lot of their identity in the diagnosis and the diagnostic process. You know, like, um, I think that is also something that needs um, our feedback to say that usually people, always people are way more than a diagnosis. And the final element, which I think is really key, but it's also very tricky, is uh, an in-depth personality assessment. And this can be done with, uh, you know, questionnaires, but also I think, and here, this is my, one of my favorite books uh, um, um, in psychiatry, which is the Psychoanalytic Diagnosis by Nancy McMillions. Uh, so this is a recent, very recent second edition. And I think really, uh, I think the relationship that you establish with the patient, the way the patient behaves sometimes is more important than what, uh, you know, like many, um, ticking box exercises can tell you. So in terms of treatment, uh, usually this is the Royal um, College of, of uh, Obstetrics and Gynecologist algorithm for uh, premenstrual disorders. And as you can see, they, they also provide premenstrual exacerbation uh, flow here, but with bipolar disorder and PMDD, we have some additional programs. So we've said um, antidepressant can trigger mania, which is quite a problem. And that pharmacological treatment is not recommended for borderline personality disorder per se. So if somebody doesn't have any hint of PMDD, but has only borderline personality disorder, giving them SSRIs might not work or any treatment uh, for what that matter. Antipsychotics and mood stabilizers are currently not in the PMDD treatment algorithms and they're not being tested enough. Uh, and they also come with significant side effects. So you don't want to get them if somebody doesn't have, doesn't need them. And there are case reports that hormone-based treatment, uh, treatments might cause mood symptoms or episodes in bipolar disorder, but there is a quite reassuring um, systematic review, although there are not many cases that says that these treatments can be uh, given without, uh, you know, triggering any, any episode. However, for this, I would say, in the case you prescribe any treatment to any of these type of patients, um, close monitoring is absolutely necessary. Um, remembering that mania and affective psychosis are psychiatric emergencies and you know, it can be triggered quite, quite quickly. It's not something that can be done in a relaxed way. Um, also, mania and affective psychosis being psychiatric emergencies, if somebody comes to you with a manic or an affective episode, even if they say, oh, I think this was triggered by hormones, uh, the treatment, the acute treatment of mania and affective psychosis is really um, quite a robust one with uh, um, antipsychotics and sedatives and mood stabilizers. There are some um, additional considerations that um, lithium and especially valproate, especially valproate, and I can't stress this enough, are associated with all sorts of menstrual abnormalities. Um, lithium concentrations may vary across the menstrual cycle, but not the concentration of valproate and lamotrigin. And I should say the study on lamotrigin is based on two patients so I would say that we know that lithium, lithium concentrations may vary. We don't know enough about valproate and amotrigine. Um, in case you, you're not familiar with lithium and lithium prescriptions, lithium is a drug with a, a very narrow therapeutic index, which means that the concentration that it's helpful is very similar to concentration that it gets toxic. So it requires blood samples and um, and therefore, uh, you can actually uh, measure concentration of lithium in the blood and, and test for this effect 
across the menstrual cycle. And uh, finally, there are there, there, there is evidence that uh, suggesting that bipolar women, um, female with bipolar disorder, um, can have a menstrual dysfunction, and um, more broadly, you know, like um, uh, neuroendocrine dysfunction and insulin resistance. Uh, you know, like um, regardless whether they're um, uh, taking valproate or, or not, and in some cases, actually, these abnormalities may. Um, you know, uh, be um, may be evident before the diagnosis of bipolar disorder. So, in terms of treatment, um, again, there is no randomized controlled trial, so I won't spend much time on this. Um, there are case reports, but I mean, like, really, I don't think we can think of really treating patients rigorously based on case reports. And then there is a naturalistic study. Again, this is not a randomized controlled trial. I think we really need more research in this area. As you can see, again, um, the numbers are um, quite small. If you count that around the world, there are a million of people with bipolar disorders. And uh, the focus of this uh, naturalistic study was lamotrigine. If you wonder what GABA R receptor modulating drugs are here in this study, were just classic sleeping pills and um, or you know like sedative pills, and uh, uh, they were found both improving mood ratings. So to conclude my my talk, um, I. Tell, told you about bipolar disorder symptom diagnosis and management. There are some symptoms of bipolar disorder such as irritability and mood instability that are shared with other conditions, including premenstrual dysphoric disorders. These disorders are both recurring disorders and the main difference is really that PMDD, of course, uh, has got a specific pattern associated with the menstrual um, uh, cycle, while bipolar disorder, the the, the uh, you know like episodes are definitely recurrent. There can be um, um, cyclicity, but usually it's not that of um, the menstrual cycle. However, women with bipolar disorder can experience premenstrual exacerbation uh, of their symptoms, or if they've been well for a while, they can also develop a PMDD, and this. Uh, these um, cases are quite tricky to, to, to treat and manage, but uh, good principles, I think, of, um, of management is a very accurate diagnosis, first of all, and then optimizing the treatment with mood stabilizer, with the treatments that the person is already having, checking that antidepressants don't contribute to, to the picture or there are not other factors. Um, psychoeducation, behavioral uh, um, and cognitive approaches are definitely useful, although what I'm telling you, of course, is not, uh, it doesn't come from randomized controlled trials, because we don't have randomized controlled trials in this population, and that it doesn't seem to be any particular contraindication on average um, to um, hormonal um, approaches. Although I, I do believe that there might be some women that, that do not um, benefit from those. So I hope uh, um, you had the opportunity to familiarize with differential diagnosis of women presented with uh, symptoms of bipolar disorder, PMDD, and to understand principles uh, of management of bipolar disorder and premenstrual exacerbation of bipolar disorder. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ariana. That was wonderful. I'm happy I put my email address on the slides so people can email me if they have questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ariana. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye.